All right, good morning, everyone. Thank you for joining us for our uh, Darien High School Electives Expo for this year. Um, so I'm Paul Ribeiro. I normally would not be up here. Uh, I'm one of the assistant principals here, but Megan Emanuelson um, is uh, not able to be here today, so I'm pinch hitting for her today. Um, we are joined by many of our department chairs and department heads who will introduce themselves um, in a second. Um, just wanted to uh, make everyone aware that we are recording today. Um, we'll have an opportunity for questions um, if anything's not answered in the course of the presentations. Um, and obviously, if you, like I said before, if you do need to leave early, we are recording this, so uh, you'll be able to, to access it online at a later date. Um, I do want to thank the DHSPA for sponsoring this event and for hosting, so uh, we really do appreciate it and appreciate all the support that we have from our parents, so thank you again. Um, before we get into some of the slides, I'll just ask um, each person to introduce themselves and what department or departments they represent. So can we start first with Christian? Just, there we go. Christian Dockham, uh, Science Department Chair for the Middle and High School here in Darien. Hi, good morning, everyone. My name's Keith Keeler. I'm the Social Studies Department Chairperson. My name is Francis Janosko. I'm the English uh, Department Chair. Good morning. I'm Felicia Bellows. I'm the Math Department Chair. Good morning. I'm Christina Mauricio, World Languages. Greg Darren, Department Coordinator for Technology Engineering, Business, and Computer Science. Jacqueline Samus, K-12 Art Curriculum Coordinator. Colleen Thompson, uh, K-12 Director of Music. Great, thank you everyone. Um, so just to get started before we actually start talking about the uh, specific subject areas, just uh, timeline wise as far as registration and um, I believe there was some information that was sent out regarding this from the guidance office. If not, there'll be some reminders. Um, also on our website under the guidance tab, um, all the registration of information is in there including our course catalogs and descriptions of all the courses that you're going to be hearing about today. But um, on February 1st, we have a um, uh, advisory day where students will meet in their advisory and uh, we'll talk about the course registration process, timeline, and how to register for classes online. Um, from there, uh, from February 7th to the 10th, uh, teachers will meet with their students during class and they'll talk about what the options are for them for their particular content area for next year. Does, that does not necessarily mean um, that a student needs to uh, do exactly what the teacher is recommending. Um, the, they may choose if the teacher is recommending an honors class, the student may choose not to take the honors class and take a standard level class um, or take a different elective, um, but the teacher will make a recommendation for that student based on their performance and based on the student's interest. Um, then from the 15th to the 28th, students will be able to go on to Aspen this is after teachers make their recommendations on Aspen, and they'll be able to select their classes. And we encourage students to do this with their parents so that there's complete transparency about what they're signing up for, um, and they'll also be able to access and see uh, what the recommendations are from uh, teachers and parents will be able to access that too. And then as just another layer to this to make sure that the students are signing up for what they should be uh, to, to meet their goals and to also meet the graduation goals, um, they'll have an opportunity to meet with their school counselor one-on-one -on -one from the 27th to the 17th of March. So there's plenty of opportunity for students um, to, to meet with their counselor and review their course selections and make any adjustments if need be uh, before I start building the schedule for the following year, which does start at the end of March. So we, we start very early with doing that. Um, so there's the, the general uh, process, I would say, for students in the next uh, couple of weeks. Um, and again, under the guidance tab, you'll be able to see uh, a ton of information regarding um, the course registration process. Again, the biggest probably resource that's on there is the course catalog, um, and you'll be able to go on there and also see what the graduation requirements are and what constitutes a full schedule for students and so on and so forth. So any questions whatsoever about the timeline, about what kids should be signing up for, um, the process, anything like that, refer to that tab or just reach out directly to your child's school counselor. They'll be able to walk you through it. Um, I think I covered most of this. Uh, we do, again, do encourage kids to have a balanced life when it comes to selecting their courses. So when they do talk to their counselor, there will be that conversation about rigor and um, what makes sense for the student, not just academically, but also what they're doing outside of school. Um, so that will be part of the conversation too. But ultimately, 
we, we want kids to do what they're passionate about and what they're really interested in, so we will uh, encourage them to pursue courses um, in those areas um, and, and, again, help reach to where their ultimate goals are uh, for their academics. So we're going to start off with history first, and I'll turn it over to Keith Keeler. Okay. Good morning, everyone. Um, so <clears throat> just as uh, Mr. Ribeiro had said, uh, we are, are in, as a department, have already started talking through courses for next year with students. Um, our hope is that they'll hear about them now early and start to think about what's a good fit for them, that we're hoping that they come home and talk with you about it, talk with their classmates about it, and talk with uh, their counselors or teachers as needed about them. Um, so there's some really great offerings that we have, and I'm gonna, just gonna, they're all listed, they all will be listed behind me in the next two slides, uh, all of our electives, but I'm gonna highlight just a few, and I'm gonna highlight some of the changes that we made um, this year. Generally, our, our changes can be categorized as opening up our enrollment uh, to make classes more accessible to students. We, we really wanted to give students as many opportunities as we could to take some of our interesting classes. Um, so an example of this is our AP Human Geography class. We've opened up, it used to be reserved only for seniors, but now we've opened it up at, to juniors as well. Um, <clears throat> this is a class that if you have a student who is really interested in understanding how people affect the environment in which they live and how the environment has impacted the people, um, this would be a great class. It's very contemporary in its focus. There's a lot of, um, a lot of studies and a lot of data that you can, you can dive into to understand what's going on in the world around us. Um, it's a really interesting class and one that students are, are always excited to take. Um, that's one of the big changes that we had. Our AP Euro class, uh, which has always been for juniors and seniors, is now also open to sophomores. We just ask, because of the, the nature of this class, because it is so intense and there's such a, a body of information that you need to master for the end of that year, uh, we are asking that for sophomores who are interested that they get their teacher's recommendation and teacher's approval. So if you have a ninth grader who is loving Western Civ, comes home raving about it, particularly the second semester, this would be a class that would be a great fit for them. Um, also, our, our Black and African American and Latino and Puerto Rican Studies class, um, the change that we have to this class is the way that we're allowing students to enroll in it. Um, so I have it listed here as one of our full year history electives. It is offered on a full year basis. Um, the Black and African American portion of the class will come in the fall. The Latino and Puerto Rican studies portion will come in the spring semester. While that's one way that students can register, Paul, if you'd hit the next slide for me. Um, <clears throat> it's also something that we're gonna offer on a semester basis. So if students are unable to register for a full year, but they really have an interest in part of this, they'll have an opportunity to register for either the fall semester Black and African American Studies or the spring semester Latino and Puerto Rican Studies class. Um, so we're hoping that that will help students have the opportunity to take classes that are really interesting to them. Um, I'll highlight another recent change that we had uh, a year or two ago renaming our humanities class, Urban Studies. Um, Urban Studies is a really, does a better job of capturing what this class is. Um, we basically try to understand an urban space um, using New York City as our case study. Um, the hallmark of this class is having an opportunity to actually go to New York on three full day field trips to really investigate neighborhoods and art and architecture and open spaces and how people interact in those spaces. Um, I kind of equate those trips into New York as the equivalent of our science labs that we have, where you're getting a chance to explore and to investigate and to apply some of what you've been learning. Um, the other class that I'll highlight is our contemporary issues class. Um, this is a class that's open to 11th and 12th graders. It's a really interesting class where students have an opportunity to shape what they'll study and they're, they're investigating um, what's going on in the world around us. They do some exploration, some inquiry into understanding the historical setting that has led to these events um, and then obviously want to understand the multiple perspectives, multiple viewpoints that go into that. 
So it's a really interesting class. Um, students are always really engaged in that one. Um, I can't say enough about all of our classes, um, but in, I will try to respect our, our time here and, and just highlight those few for you this morning. If you have any questions, feel free to reach out to me. Um, your students, again, should also be hearing this from their teachers and getting this pitch if the class is available to their class for the following year. They should be hearing all of this and should be able to talk about what they might be interested in the social studies department. So thank you. Thanks, Keith. And, and this is um, you know, part of the dialogue that should happen with um, students and their teacher and their counselor and yourselves as their parents is for the electives, um, there are different electives that have different styles, and some of them are tailored towards um, the learning styles of a student. So um, in some instances, for some of the history electives, they're very heavy with reading, right, um, and, and writing papers, and that's a focus. Uh, for others, they're more um, geared towards uh, conversation and debate and presentations and, and things like that, which is obviously a, a different learning style. So like when Keith is talking about the contemporary issues class, that comes to mind. It's a lot of um, conversation and debate and presentations and not as much of reading a textbook and um, writing essays like the AP European history class that he described before. So um, there are, not all the electives are the same. Yeah, there are some that are uh, geared differently. Um, when, when I used to work up in the counseling office and I would meet with my students, um, kids would come to me and say like, what's an easy elective? And I would say, well, yeah, what's easy for you is not necessarily easy for someone else. So it's not just a matter of signing up for an easy elective, it's really signing up for something that um, is geared towards your learning style and geared towards what your goals are for, for high school and afterwards. So um, that's something that's important to, to have that conversation about. Um, and kids, in all honesty, I don't expect them to know that, those answers, which is why they should rely on um, their teacher, their school counselor, and if they have any upperclassmen that they were friends with, alumni, any older siblings, um, to, to really access them. Um, you know, there are some kids that will make choices based on teacher. Um, there might be a particular teacher that has taught a certain class um, year in and year out for the past couple of years. That's not a guarantee that they'll continue to do that. So I usually will try to frown upon students choosing a course specifically because they think a particular teacher is teaching it because there's no guarantee that's the case. They really should be choosing the course based on the content area and the style of the course and what the expectations are. Christian, you're up. Uh, thank you, Mr. Ribeiro. Uh, so the, the science department here has a, a wide variety of classes. Um, traditionally, the, the sequence for uh, most ninth, incoming ninth graders is biology in ninth grade, and then either earth science and chemistry in 10th grade, and physics and or chemistry in 11th grade. And that sort of uh, sets the stage for the other opportunities that we have within the department. Um, I'd like to spend most of the time sort of highlighting one of the more unique opportunities that students have here at, at DHS, and that is our um, authentic science research class. And, and this is an opportunity that is, is unique uh, to our department in, in that the students really are the driver of where they want to go, and they sort of decide and direct their own science journey over the course of three years. Um, this three-year course, uh, it, really focuses on student research uh, in their area of uh, their own choice or their own interests where they formulate a hypothesis, carry out uh, an immense amount of bibliographic research uh, and also laboratory or field research um, under the guidance of a professional scientist or mentor within their field of choice um, and ultimately uh, end as seniors presenting their final research in a, a variety of competitions and um, and ultimately the STEM symposium here at DHS at the end of their senior year. Um, it is unique because it is a three-year commitment and each one of those years has specific components of the course. Um, so it starts at the summer after freshman year or summer before sophomore year with uh, a summer reading assignment um, and then they focus throughout sophomore year on doing that uh, bibliographic research and uh, looking at honing in their interests. Uh, the summer of junior year is really focused on their research project uh, and their topic in a uh, specific topic, and they start to identify possible mentors and reach out to the mentors within that field of choice uh, to help them guide through the actual research uh, piece of, of their project. 
Uh, that research takes place over the summer after junior year, so really they may be in a laboratory, they may be out in the field, uh, they may be in the woods of New Hampshire looking at uh, how the migration of beetles are impacting um, pine trees. Um, there really is such a wide variety of, of unique opportunities that our students have taken. Uh, over the past uh, uh, years as part of this, this course. And then senior year is really sort of an analyzing, completing that data analysis and putting together their results in order to compete in a wide variety of uh, STEM competitions, the STEM science fair here in, in Connecticut. Um, and then the uh, ASR symposium is sort of the culmination of that where they present their final uh, projects to their peers and to the community at large. Um, some of the recent projects that, that were presented last year include a mapping of Martian cloud cover using artificial intelligence and deep learning tools. Uh, we had a project looking at the evolutionary shifts in migratory songbirds um, due to climate change. Um, and then another interesting one was the therapeutic impacts of a uh, coral program on patients with Parkinson's disease. So you can get a sense of the variety of interests that our students have and our students have pursued through uh, this program. Um, if you're questioning whether or not your student uh, or your incoming 10th grader is, is ripe for the ASR program. They must be passionate about science. They must be self-motivated and self-directed. Uh, independent learners who are, who are looking for an opportunity to really focus in on, on an interest. Um, and they must be hardworking because there is a lot of work that goes into this and a commitment over a three-year period, which includes, uh, as you can, um, as you've heard, a vast amount of summer work and work outside of the classroom. So if you do have a student who is interested in this course, they can register for that during the course registration process. And they must complete an application as well that includes a writing sample. Um, and those applications are provided and um, are given out during their biology class as a ninth grader. Um, <clears throat> some of our upperclassmen, uh, 11th and 12th grade electives um, in terms of uh, our program include botany, which is looking at uh, the study of plants. Uh, we have a marine science class that really focuses on some of the, the local aspects, uh, including Long Island Sound. Uh, a neuro neurobiology class um, that is very much aligned with, with our psychology class in, in the history department. Uh, we also have a forensic science class that looks at, uh, ultimately culminates in, in a crime scene investigation and looking at the, the forensic science behind that to solve a crime. Uh, we have a new STEM uh, and design course that looking at the uh, impact of humans in our local, national, and, and global environments and really how we can focus on creating some solutions to some of those problems so starting at the local level and then sort of scaling up to um, the national and, and global level. Uh, and then applications of physics and chemistry really give students an opportunity to have a more hands-on approach to some of the chemistry content and physics content that are part of our uh, 300 level physics and chem classes. Lastly, uh, for those who are looking for a more in-depth or more rigorous uh, science experience, we have AP level classes in biology, chemistry, and physics. Those are all second year courses, so students must have a first year uh, course in, in those content areas in order to uh, uh, meet the prerequisites, and then we also have an AP environmental science class uh, that looks at, again at how humans impact our, our local and, and national environment, um, and that's usually taken as an 11th or 12th grader. So really our, our AP courses uh, are elective choices that students may take uh, during 11th and 12th grade. So that gives a, a pretty um, quick overview of our department, and uh, certainly if there's any questions, I'm happy to uh, address those either afterwards or uh, via email. So thanks for coming this morning. Thanks, Christian. We will turn it over to Felicia now for math. Good morning, and thank you for coming this morning. Um, so by now, your children have experienced probably one or two math courses at the high school, and pretty much we have a sequentially driven program 
with three foundational courses that most students take, and that would be Algebra I, Geometry, and Algebra II. Those courses are offered at 300 and 400 level. Um, some students may have taken Algebra I at Middlesex or at middle school and entered the high school taking Geometry and then on to Algebra II. Some students may have entered the high school taking Algebra I in ninth grade and choose to double up in 10th grade and take Geometry and Algebra II or follow the sequence in a traditional pathway and take geometry in 10th grade, algebra two in 11th. But regardless, around 11th or 12th grade, they have some choices. Um, and I mean, they always have choices, but they have some choices um, as far as whether or not they wanna follow a calculus pathway or a statistical pathway or both. Um, so around 11th, so I've listed some electives that we have, they're full year courses. Um, Students who choose to follow a traditional pathway will take pre-calculus um, following Algebra 2 and then on to calculus. Um, pre-calculus is a course that feeds into calculus, so it's a traditional course. Um, it covers nth degree equations, exponential equations, rational functions, um, traditional pre-calculus course. Um, it can be taken at the 300 and 400 level. That would then feed into calculus, and we have several different levels of calculus. We have a 300 calculus designed to prepare students for college calculus. Um, we have AP calculus, which also prepares students for college calculus. And then um, there's multivariable calculus, which is um, a third course in calculus. So there are many options for calculus if students choose to follow that pathway. Um, in general, taking if, if calculus is what students think that they are going to take in, in college, regardless of the level that they take in high school, it's a win-win because they're giving themselves a, so, a strong foundation for future courses in college. Most students choose to repeat calculus when they go to college because they come back and talk to us, um, and it's a strong A in their college class. So that's generally students, you know, take it in high school so that they can enter college confident and strong in their calculus. Um, also, we have probability and statistics, which is a great course for students. Um, I was actually invited today to, to watch. They, um, and I wrote down some of the things they do. Um, they focus on understanding probability, risk insurance, um, and expectation gaming, and how to verify, refute hypotheses. Um, they design experiments, collect survey data, create casino games, which is what I was invited to today, and explore many other applications of introductory statistical concepts. But students love this course. And it really is a nice course because it lets students appreciate and have fun with math, and also gives them a little bit of statistical background because generally a lot of colleges now require one semester of calculus and one semester of business statistics or some level of statistics. So it's a nice foundational course for students that way. And they can take that in addition to uh, you know, another math course. We also have AP statistics, which is more intense. Um, and that course um, is, you know, can count as a college calculus, I mean, sorry, college statistics course. Um, but that's generally students who are following an honors pathway would follow into the AP statistical course. And we do have students take both. So students will take calculus and AP statistics if they are choosing um, to double up in math junior or senior year. So there are a lot of options. During course conversation days, um, the students should be talking to their teachers about future pathways and also about what they you know, think would be a best fit for them. We also have college math topics for students who want to refresh all of their skills prior to entering college um, and, and explore some applications of how everything that they've learned can apply to the real world. So that's um, another option for seniors if they're not necessarily strong in calculus, pre-calculus, and they want to still have another year of math and be prepared for college for all the prerequisite skills that are needed in the college entrance exams. So um, there are many options for students. Please don't hesitate to reach out to your student's teacher, um, to myself, or counselors, um, because I know it can be confusing, but um, there's, there's a good fit for everyone. Okay, thank you. Thanks, Felicia. Uh, we'll turn it over to Francis in English. 
Okay, well, good morning, and I'm delighted to be here to talk to you about some of the offerings that we have here at the high school in the English department. And um, so I first want to point out on the left, um, so those are our traditional English electives, and um, I think we have some great electives that are meant not only for those kids who are passionate about the written and spoken English language, but also for those students who are looking for opportunities to express themselves creatively and to learn a little bit about themselves along the way. On the right, you'll see a list of what we're calling electives, and I put that in quotations because these are essentially um, courses that our non-AP seniors must take for one semester. They're all uh, literature themed, and um, we have some great opportunities there, and I'll talk about those in just a minute. Um, first, I'm going to uh, look a little bit more closely into two of our electives. These are media studies electives. And um, just so when your student is making choices, these are not located in the English portion of the course catalog, but they are listed under media. Um, these are two really fun courses uh, for students. And I wanna point out that our intro to media studies is a great fit for ninth graders. One of the highlights of that course is they'll have exposure to some of the more traditional uh, journalism writing genres, such as the editorial, the news report, uh, the profile, and the review. And if I can just spend a second talking about the review, we're all familiar with music reviews, movie reviews, restaurant reviews. We publish all of those, or a lot of those reviews, in our online newspaper. Um, we even do video game reviews. This is a chance for students to um, learn uh, or to brush up on the writing skills, but by doing so, writing about a topic that they know a lot about and are passionate about. So this is a great fit, I would say, for ninth graders looking for opportunities to work in, on their writing in a different kind of way. Um, we also have a course entitled Digital Journalism, a Blended Learning Model. Um, this course uh, is a traditional course here at the high school, but the model is very different, and we're using this model, and it's happening um, as we speak. This is the first semester that that course is running. And in essence, a blended model just means that our students um, encounter some traditional in-person instructional days, but also on their schedule, they have some um, non-person -per, non in-person meetings, uh, some digital meetings um, where they will encounter digital conversations and activities um, that they don't have to have a traditional class meeting to experience. So um, this is a new model for Darien Public Schools. It's widely used around the country, but this is our first foray in the district into this new model. So I'm sure you'll hear a lot more about that um, coming up this semester. But I'll point out one last thing about it. It's a project-based course where most of the pieces that the kids work on are published in our school newspaper. Um, Next, I'll talk about, um, we have some writing-based electives. Um, the first one is called Writing with Purpose, and it's pretty self-explanatory in that it gives students a chance to work on some very practical writing situations that all of our students at one point will encounter. We also offer creative writing levels one and two, and these are opportunities for students to um, workshop and get feedback on their poetry, their short stories, even chapters of novels, and get feedback from peers and from the teacher. We have performance-based electives. We have dramas, drama level one and two. Um, this is a fun, active class that's designed not just for our theater through eight kids. Um, they do as much with um, public speaking skills in that course as they do with um, acting techniques. So it's a great fit if your student is looking to develop the skills in speaking in front of an audience. Um, it's a fun, active chance for them to get up and move around during the day, which in other courses doesn't always happen. Um, we also have critical approaches to film, and that is ex essentially a film genre class where they explore the Western, film noir, screwball comedies, science fiction, among other genres. 
I'm going to take one last look at our senior year. And as I said earlier, all non-AP seniors are going to take one of those uh, listed electives that you see under uh, the first semester. I want to highlight the last on the list. Um, it's our newest course that we've added to this lineup called the Literature of New York City. It ran this fall for the very first time. The early returns are great. I expect this is going to be another uh, big hit for our seniors going forward. Um, the other semester that our non-AP seniors will experience um, will be in a course entitled English Capstone. Um, this is another great course. This is our fifth year of running the course this year. The essential question is, what does it mean to be an educated citizen? Um, and it's a chance for our students to reflect on their education and experience in Darien Public Schools, and then to think about what they're going to be doing with that education as they move forward upon graduation. That course um, uh, culminates in a graduation requirement paper, a term paper that we call the narrative inquiry paper, which is a blend of a personal narrative and an exploratory synthesis-based paper. Um, it's, a, it's a great course, and our, our kids actually really enjoy having that as, as their kind of uh, terminal English class. We also offer um, advanced places, placement courses to juniors and seniors. Um, in 11th grade, we offer AP Lang, which is American Lit focused, as are all of our um, junior courses all focused on American literature. Um, students who don't take AP Lang as juniors have an opportunity to take the course as a senior. Uh, obviously, the course curriculum is very different. Um, and you can't take it both as a junior and a senior, um, but you can take in your senior year our uh, AP Lit course. So both of those AP offerings for our seniors are available to any student who maintains at, uh, at least a B plus average in their 300 level um, American Lit course as juniors, okay? So all of our students are gonna have an opportunity to access these courses over their um, career here at the high school. So that is a brief overview of what we offer in English. Um, if you have any other questions, don't hesitate to reach out. I love having conversations about our courses. I'm very proud of them. And um, if you have questions or your kids have them, um, please send them my way. Thanks. Francis, can I just ask uh, two clarifying questions really sure. quick that some people in the audience may have? Sure. So number one, the critical approaches to film course, yes. is that just a senior year course or is that also open to other grade levels? That is open to sophomores, juniors, and seniors. Great. And then for the senior electives, mm -hmm. um, if, if you had a junior that was you know, really passionate about literature and wanted to take one of those uh, earlier, could, could they do that or are those exclusive just for senior year? That's a great question. And the answer is yes, they are available. And we, it doesn't happen that often, but our students who are really interested in exploring as much as they can in the English department and curriculum offerings, um, we do have juniors enroll the, in those courses as electives. Great. And then one more thing that maybe I'll give you a break, Francis, and go back to Keith. It's technically not an elective, but since we're all here, maybe it might be good to spend 30 seconds just to talk about junior year and the American Studies uh, uh, courses for uh, history and English. Yeah. So uh, as, as students come into their junior year, uh, they, they are going to be taking some form of American history. Um, so if a student is in a 300 level American history class and a 300 level American literature class, then they are going to end up getting paired, um, in, they're going to get put into a pair of history and lit classes that'll be kind of back to back um, periods like two and three or five and six or seven and eight. Um, and we actually have really interesting rooms for this as well, where the walls actually will physically come down and open up the space between the two classes. So we have, um, as we break down that wall, we also are kind of breaking down the wall between the history and the literature and diving into like an American studies approach at times. Um, so it's a, that's the, the 300 level uh, on both sides is what students would take. Students are also able to take um, AP Lang, Yes. Right? Yep. AP language and composition on the English side. They can take AP US history on my side. 
if they take those two classes, then they, just the nature of them, they stand there separated. Um, and for students who are in one honors level and one 300 level, um, so for example, if a student takes AP language and composition as a junior, but they're in 300 level American history, then they're in a, a standalone American history class that is a rich American history experience. Um, they don't have the benefit of the, the two courses, the lit and the history together, um, but many students are able to make those connections and it still comes up in conversations in classes anyway. Am I missing anything? Uh, I'll just add one quick thing to that. And um, so the American Studies 300 level option that uh, Mr. Keeler just spoke of. Um, so both courses move chronologically through the history of America and its literary tradition so that um, as we go, there are these points along the way where we have our teachers where they do move the wall and they have interdisciplinary lessons and they have several projects over the course of the year where um, the project reflects a, a literature-based perspective as well as a historical perspective. So it's a great program, it's a great opportunity for kids um, to experience something on the history side of the wall that supports their understanding of literature and vice versa. It's a, it's a really great program that we've had in place for many, many years. Thank you. Um, Francis, reading and study skills? What is that? Are you, you going to cover reading and study skills, or is that me doing that one? Reading and study skills. Oh, reading and study skills. Um, I could do it if you want. Yeah, why, why don't you? Okay, so another elective that we have for our students that um, uh, is a, a general education elective is our reading and study skills class. Uh, for those of you that have uh, older children that went through school, they may have taken this here. Um, but basically a student that um, needs some extra support, whether it's with their um, organization and time management or their writing skills or you're concerned about some of their reading levels, um, they can take this course that is taught by a reading specialist. Uh, the unique thing about this course is that it's something that you could take multiple times. It's not something that's limited to just you take it one semester and that's it. It is a course that you can do um, more than one semester and we've had some instances where kids will do it for two years or three years um, and it really helps prep them. Um, some of the feedback I've gotten from kids in the past that have taken the class have said it's really helped them with um, uh, prepping and getting ready for their SATs or ACTs. Um, others have said, you know, the teacher incorporates, um, you know, what we're doing in class as part of the strategy. So it's not necessarily extra work. If they're going over a certain reading strategy, let's say, the teacher will say, like, what are you currently reading in English? I'm reading Huck Finn. Okay, let's break out Huck Finn and do your homework for Huck Finn, but utilizing this specific reading strategy that I'm teaching you in the reading and study skills course. So it is an elective. It's not, um, some people feel like uh, when they read it or hear it, they say, oh, only students in, with IEPs or in special education can take the course. That's not the case whatsoever. This is a general education course that students can take as elective. You get a grade, you get credit. Um, and for kids that struggle in some of these areas, it is a very good option to, to get some, some extra help. And now we'll go, oh, oh sure. Yes, it starts at the beginning of this. Can, Francis, season. can you just repeat the question? Oh, the question is, um, we have an incoming ninth grade who's heard about this Poetry Out Loud recitation competition that we annually participate in. Um, it's a chance where um, for a couple of weeks we have students within an English class um, select from among hundreds of different poems that are both traditional, some are traditional, some are contemporary, and they essentially practice delivering out loud that poem. That is happening again this year. We do it annually, and it happens at the beginning of second semester. So we're just finishing up with midterms, as you know, when we're moving on to second semester. We're just beginning second semester, and that's gonna happen in um, our classes maybe today. So you'll see that soon. Great, thank you. And now we'll go over to Jacqueline, talk about the wonderful world of art. Hi, thanks for coming out this morning. My name is Jacqueline Samus, and I'm the K-12 Art Curriculum Coordinator and an art teacher at DHS. Today we're gonna to talk about the elective courses offered through the art department. I would encourage you to follow our art Instagram to see the most current work that's happening across the department. 
On our first slide, this is our most recent Scholastic Award winners. These four pieces come from our different AP art class offerings. On our second slide are four more offerings that are coming from Drawing and Painting 3, Graphic Design, AP, and Art Foundations. The complete list and images will be included in February's DHS happenings, or you can see them currently on our latest Instagram reel. All right. A brief overview of the courses we have. We have 23 different courses available to students and 11 that are open to freshmen. There is a drawing and painting path, a ceramics and sculpture path, a digital and photography path. Students can reach an AP or honors level course through either pathway, and students are encouraged to try a wide variety of art electives and are able to move between the pathways based on their own personal interest. This matrix is very hard to read from far away, and it's small, but it kind of shows you the sequencing between the different courses, and you can find this on the guidance webpage, and it'll also talk about the prereqs that are for each of the individual courses. So the first pathway I want to talk about is the drawing and painting option for students. Students begin with Art Foundations and Drawing and Painting 1. In these courses, students focus on skill development and trying a wide variety of mediums and creative solutions to class projects. In Drawing and Painting 2 and 3 Honors, students are able to bring more of their own personal choice into how they solve creative problems, and students are given more personal responsibility to come up with their own ideas and choosing the material that would work best for their solution. Finally, students reach the AP level, where students create a portfolio for the AP board to review. Drawing and printmaking are two standalone courses that are open to all students. Our ceramics and sculpture path, students typically start with ceramics one, which is our most popular course in the art department as an elective. In this year long, in this year long course, students are able to focus on learning how to throw on the wheel and hand building techniques. Next in Ceramics 2, another year-long course, students continue to work with wheel throwing and creating larger, more complex forms on the wheel with hand-building components. And finally, students reach the AP level where they create a portfolio for the AP board to review. Additionally, clay sculpture, sculpture, and historical art making are 3D courses open to all students at DHS. And lastly is our photography and digital path. And I'm very proud to say that we still have a darkroom photography where students can take 35 millimeter photos in photos one and two and develop in our darkroom. Students will learn how to use a digital or learn how to use a traditional SLR camera and how to print and manipulate photos in the darkroom. Students still find something very magical in developing their own prints. Digital Photo One has quickly become our second most popular course, and it counts towards the STEM requirements or fine arts requirement. Students can continue to explore digital photo through digital photo two, and in both courses, students learn how to use and manipulate a digital SLR camera and how to use Photoshop to enhance their photos. Next is graphic design one and two, where students learn how to use Adobe Photoshop and Illustrator to create original digital drawings and images. Both these courses count towards the STEM or fine arts requirement. And finally, students are able to take AP by either taking all four of the photo classes or all four of the digital classes. Uh, lastly, our DHS Art Show, featuring our AP Art students, will take place on Tuesday, May 16th in the cafeteria. There will be over a thousand pieces on display, and I hope you'll come out and check that out for us. Um, thanks, and I'm happy to take any questions at the end or over email. Thanks, Jacqueline. Um, the, the Art Department, I just want to take a second to point out, because uh, it's a good example. When your students are looking at electives, to, to make sure to, to clarify when they're researching it, are they looking at an elective that's just a semester long? Uh, a half year course, let's say here, like the photography class, or a full year elective like the ceramics classes are. Um, so each department has a variety of full year and half year electives, so I just like to remind people to, when they're looking at them to make sure that um, what they're looking at is either a full year course or a half year course um, because it makes a difference in their overall scheduling. And let's go over to music. Hi everyone, I'm Colleen Thompson, I'm the Director of Music. Uh, so I wanted to talk about the electives available for music students at the high school. Uh, our first set of electives are our full year music ensembles. So this is your traditional band, chorus, and orchestra class. Um, if your student has not taken band, chorus, or orchestra at the high school level, it's not too late to start um, in high school. Uh, particularly if they have experience on an instrument from middle school. Um, chorus students could start um, taking chorus any year, 9 through 12. It doesn't require any previous experience. Uh, the students start in the concert level ensembles, and then they have an opportunity to audition 
for an honors level ensemble, which is wind ensemble for band, tutor singers for chorus, and chamber orchestra for uh, the orchestra students. And those auditions and placements are happening now, uh, so students who are already in uh, the concert level ensembles will find out if they are uh, recommended for the honors level ensembles uh, soon. Uh, students can take both an instrumental ensemble and a choral ensemble at the high school level. Um, so we've been able to schedule it so that the concert level band, chorus, and orchestra meet the same period as do the chamber level band, chorus, and orchestra. So they can actually do a split where they spend some time in their chorus class and some time in their instrumental class. Uh, so students don't have to choose between the two if they're very interested in music. Uh, so let's talk about the music electives that are uh, outside of the performing ensembles. Uh, we have an exciting new elective offered, which is called Guitar Ensemble. And uh, this is an opportunity for students who want to learn how to play guitar for the first time, or for students who already have some experience with the guitar. Uh, this is a semester class. It's performance-based. And like I said, it's open to students at any skill level. So the teacher will differentiate the class so that if there are students who can play the solo lines on guitar and others that can play the backup uh, parts, um, it should be a really uh, exciting class. And I hope that it'll bring uh, some new students into the music department who are interested in playing guitar. Uh, that is a semester class. We also offer Music Technology 1 and 2. Uh, music Technology 1 is, uh, they're both taught by our chorus teacher, Chris Andrade, who is uh, quite good at the technology aspects of music. Um, and what's neat about the class is it um, teaches students um, really the, the basics, but a really um, comprehensive view of technology. So um, it teaches them how to set up microphones and do the backstage work, um, and also work on digital composition and those aspects of music. Um, and then you can move on to Music Technology 2. Those are both semester classes, and they also count for a STEM credit. So if students are looking uh, to fulfill their graduation requirements and they want to do so uh, in the music department or uh, get a little bit of a taste of what music technology is like, that will fulfill that need as well. Uh, we offer Music Theory. Music Theory is a non-performance class for students who are really interested in uh, composing or learning more about um, just note names and the basics of music. Maybe they want to study and analyze music and they're interested in it in that way. That's a great class and that becomes a prerequisite for our AP Music Theory class. This is a full year class um, and they actually take uh, an AP test at the end. Um, many students who choose to uh, think that they might major or minor in music find that this class is helpful to prepare them for college um, and also they can uh, take an AP class in music, which is often helpful for students. Uh, we have some co-curricular musical opportunities. So um, these are available for students whether they've signed up for um, an ensemble or music class during the day or perhaps they're taking private lessons and they're not taking a music class during the day, but they still uh, want to participate in jazz or they want to participate in strings. Uh, they can audition for those ensembles in the fall. Um, we also have our Young Composers concert, uh, which is coming up soon. Um, it's an opportunity for students, uh, whether they're in the department or not, to compose an original song and have that premiered uh, on stage here in March. Um, and then Theater 308 is, uh, you can audition for the musical, you could also play in the pit orchestra. And finally, we, have a, we do have a music honor society, which is called TRIAM. And this is for students who are uh, in their school day ensemble and they want to uh, participate at a higher level through service and performance. Um, and it's really a great opportunity to uh, meet other students. And what's great about the music ensembles is um, it really is a ninth through 12th grade experience if you want it to be. And students uh, can, uh, they get really close to each other and it becomes, um, has a, a club aspect and an extracurricular aspect as well with trips and uh, weekend opportunities. So really great opportunities in, in music for students who are interested. And I'd love to answer your questions if you'd like to contact me uh, after this presentation. Thank you.
Thanks, Colleen. Um, Colleen mentioned, um, uh, uh, and Jacqueline did too, about uh, certain courses in their areas counting as STEM credits. So um, again, I want to direct everyone to the guidance page. Um, the list of graduation requirements are on there. Um, and in some instances, we have specific ones. So like four years of English is required. Uh, but then we also have some more general ones where it's you know nine credits of humanities or nine credits of STEM are required. And there's different pathways or avenues to get to those uh, graduation requirements. So I would just encourage you to look at the website. Um, your child's school counselor keeps track of that every year. They, they literally will sit down at the end of every year and look at the transcript and make sure that each student is on path to fulfill their graduation requirements. But for your own knowledge base, I just would encourage you to go to um, the guidance page and look for the graduation requirements to see specifically what they are. They did change for those of you, again, that had some uh, children that went through the system and graduated a couple of years ago. Uh, the graduation requirements did change a couple of years ago at the state level, which means it changed at the local level too. So, um, you know, we used to require 22 credits to graduate, now it's 25, and it's broken out into different areas. So when you have the time, by all means, go to the, the website. Uh, and now we talk about world language. Christina. Hi, good morning everyone. I'm Christina Vasquez Mauricio. I'm chair of world languages for grades six through 12. Uh, by now, most of your children have taken a world language uh, in some form or another in grades K through eight, or are currently taking a world language here at DHS. And I just wanna quickly share um, my and my colleagues' gratitude for your support for world languages, particularly um, here at the high school. We currently offer a sequential and leveled course of study in French, Latin, Mandarin, and Spanish that focuses on developing our students' proficiency in speaking, writing, listening, and reading. Next year, we also plan to offer an American Sign Language One course within our department as well. All of our curricula are thematic and based on the six AP themes, and students can study all languages offered here at DHS for all four years of high school. Um, with the exception of the one-year world language graduation requirement, all world language courses are academic electives. An overwhelming majority of students at DHS continue their world language studies for all four years of high school. And similar to the study of math, the study of a language is based on the progressive acquisition of skills, and our leveled sequences currently culminate in senior year. And students that take Spanish or French can reach um, AP Spanish Language and Culture, AP Spanish Literature and Culture, uh, AP French Language and Culture, or continue on a traditional sequence and take French 5, or one of our new content-based uh, Spanish five classes in the arts or film, which are new for the coming school year. We previously just had a class called Spanish five, but um, we're allowing students to choose based on their interest um, for this um, level five class. And um, you can read, in the interest of time, you can read that, but all of this information is, is also on our, on our website, and students will be talking about it with their teachers during course conversation days. For students studying Latin or Mandarin, their sequence culminates in level four. And as you can see from the slides, the topics and themes are uh, quite advanced. To match the proficiency our students acquire uh, throughout our K through 12 program. Aside from the courses students can take and enjoy, we also offer many opportunities outside of the classroom for all learners. This year, we will continue our global education international travel program for rising juniors uh, for rising sophomores, sorry, juniors and seniors, which gives our world language students an opportunity to practice their language skills abroad. In April of 2023, we traveled to Spain. There's the photo over here. Uh, 58 of us, well, 58 students uh, and eight chaperones traveled to Spain. And this April, we'll be traveling to Ecuador and the Galapagos Islands. In April of 2024, we plan to offer a Spanish language trip as well as a French language trip. And through our program, we also offer trips in the summer that are open to all students, not just world language students, like last year's trip to Switzerland and Germany and this summer's upcoming trip to Italy. These opportunities allow students to take their language skills on the road and to learn about other cultures within a fun academic setting. We also have honor societies in all of our languages and assess our students' proficiency yearly in order for them to earn the uh, State of Connecticut Seal of Biliteracy as well as the Global Seal of Biliteracy by graduation. The seals of biliteracy serve as proof of language proficiency and in most cases can earn students a college credit or placement once they arrive there. 
And if you have any questions about our course offerings or our initiatives that occur outside of the classroom, um, you can check out our website, you can email me, um, and I update our website, which is on the curriculum page of DarianPS.org, very frequently with the help of my colleagues, and we'll soon be updating it with information about the new Spanish 5 courses, as well as um, information about the seal of biliteracy. And if you have specific questions about a course that your child is currently in because you're thinking about next year, just know that we have um, course conversation days coming up ahead of what uh, Mr. Rivera talked about where students will be selecting their classes for next year. You can reach out to your child's current world language teacher or of course um, you can reach out to me. Thank you. Thank you, Christina. And last but not least, the man that has the most departments under his name, uh, Greg Darren. Good morning again. Thank you for being here. Greg Darren, I'm the department coordinator for technology and engineering, business and computer science. Um, if you're, uh, our website is up there listed too, which will have much of this information on there. And if you follow me on Twitter, you'll get to see a little bit more of an inside look of what's going on in the classroom. And you'll also see some of those pictures on the newsletter that is distributed um, monthly. So for our business and uh, business education and computer science, in technology and engineering is I'm going to say a couple generalizations. So in general, um, all of our classes are semester long with the exception of our AP computer science and our advanced computer science courses. Um, all of our courses in general fulfill a STEM requirement with the exception of the pre-law course in um, business. So with that being said, our business education opportunities for students, and um, all of these are open for 9th through 12th graders. We have investing in personal finance, um, and that's kind of almost a, a life skill course in general for people to, to um, kind of manage their finances in life to save for college and homes and um, uh, everything of that sort. Accounting would be a next level course for kids who want to follow more of an accounting uh, business pathway. We have pre-law. Uh, focus on uh, business law. They have uh, mock trials as one of their uh, main projects in that course. Uh, business and entrepreneurship are for students who um, are interested in learning more about um, starting a business, coming up with a concept, and kind of marketing that business to others, which uh, leads into also um, marketing essentials. There's no prerequisite for um, any of these courses right now except for accounting that I mentioned. Uh, Marketing Essentials is open for 9th through 12th as well, and they'll focus on, um, you know, target demographics for uh, marketing a certain product and statistically determining um, uh, who might purchase and how much they might purchase from different, um, different categories of uh, our um, society. So uh, sports marketing is the second level of marketing. You would have to take marketing first for that, so that probably in general for 10th to 11th graders, um, and that will focus on um, marketing sports teams, which is uh, kind of a, a huge market, especially with playoffs coming up this weekend in the Super Bowl. Uh, computer science, our computer science pathways, our intro course is a semester course. That's our computer science focused on Java language. And once they take that, they could go into AP computer science and then follow up with advanced programming. Um, our AP computer science principles course uh, you do not need to take a computer science course first, although it is recommended. Um, however, you just need to complete um, an algebra course with a B or better to be able to get into the AP Computer Science Principles course. That is also a full year course. And we have computer animation. Uh, kids will utilize um, some Adobe Suite software to make graphics and animate them. Uh, one of the projects they do in there is to animate a child's book, uh, which is a fun activity. And uh, web design course uh, one and two is there's a little coding involved with that too, some HTML coding, um, and a lot of it is focused on um, design uh, for websites um, using some other softwares as well. We use some Adobe softwares to be able to um, program that as well. Um, some of our extracurricular clubs you'll see on the bottom right there. There's programming club, and we have our DECA business course as well, which are outside of school hours. And for the uh, technology and engineering course courses, uh, we have uh, applications of physics and chem course, which is a hands-on science elective that Christian already mentioned. We have our architecture courses, one and two, um, both a semester each. We'll focus on residential um, home design. They will design in CAD, computer-aided drafting software, and build models. Uh, woodworking one and two, um, pretty self-explanatory, using the resource of wood, processing that to realize um, how important that actually is for our society, that renewable resource. 
um, and getting some hands-on exposure to some skills and utilizing some tools and machinery. We have the DIY course, do-it-yourself course, and um, another sort of kind of a life skill type of course for kids to be able to learn how to maintain um, their cars and their homes. Um, and you'll see that picture is from DIY. That's probably the extent of what we do. They're doing a brake job on, on the car that we have here. But for the most part, automotive is basic um, maintenance of car, checking fluids, air and tires, and things of that sort. And we do some electrical and some um, sheetrock and some plumbing as well. Uh, the electronics course um, is a little bit different than the residential electric, electrical that you would do in DIY, but it's more focused on smaller um, electronics, how circuits work, what resistors do, transistors, and that might be for a student who might be going into engineering or electrical engineering to follow up with that course. Uh, drafting, now called CAD, computer-aided drafting and design, uh, similar to architecture, you're going to be using CAD, but it's more the design of smaller um, mechanical type objects, some things that move. It could be something as simple as a phone holder um, or something as complicated as something that has to um, actually move and work like a robotics. Uh, our Fundamentals of Engineering course is a, is a good intro course for kids who are not sure to kind of get their feet wet with a little bit of design, a little bit of tools and machinery, a little bit of electronics um, to see what pathways that they might want to, to fulfill or, or, or follow. And then we have the follow-up to Fundamentals of Engineering, which is a Principles of Engineering course. And right now that is focused on um, robotics. And it's competitive robotics where, uh, believe it or not, there's a competition this Saturday in Norwalk at the Norwalk Havoc Robotics League that some of the students from this course are competing in. It's a, it's a spin-off battle bots, and they make a robot that um, gets in the cage, and they battle with another robot. Um, the Independent in Projects and Engineering course is a uh, junior-senior level course. And um, just as the name implies, the students will independently choose a project that they want, a long-term engineering project that will, they will focus on for two years. Um, they will study that in depth and go through a design cycle process to continue to um, design, build, improve upon, and then redesign and build and test this product out um, over a, a two-year span. And um, the video broadcasting class is uh, not listed under technology and engineering, but that is a semester course listed under media studies. And they'll learn the basics of um, uh, making video productions with uh, small commercials and um, some small video productions. You'll see on the bottom right over there, those are some of our other clubs that we have available. Uh, Women in STEM, the, we have a National Technical Honor Society, uh, our first robotics program in addition to the, um, the BattleBots program, and a Technology Student Association is another competitive club as well. So um, I put a QR code because I know you probably can't see this here. Um, this is just our recommended pathways. I have some hard copies that I'll have out front um, right after this. And these are recommended pathways, and it'll, it'll, you'll see like 9 through 12 there. But because if your student can't get into the class as a ninth grader, they could take it as a 10th grader. And I think this just better sets up students who might be following um, an engineering pathway or a business pathway um, for college. This gives them a, a nice foundation for that. And I'm happy to dis discuss this more. Um, feel free to send me an email, or we could um, chat after this. Thank you. Thanks, Greg. I, I joke around with these guys uh, sometimes. Uh, tons, obviously, I think, you, you, hopefully you're getting the sense, we have a, a million electives that kids can take, a million courses. Um, each one of our department chairs are very passionate and very possessive of their uh, electives. Uh, my personal opinion, uh, the two electives that I wish every student would take before they leave here at graduation, one is with Keith with the Contemporary Issues class. I used to be a history teacher, so I feel like that's, that's a given that every kid should do, and Greg's DIY class. I mean, being able to fi fi fix little small things in the house or check your fluids in your car and stuff like that, that's just a general life skill that I wish all of our kids knew how to do. So those are the two electives I would say are, are not my favorite, but the ones I think that are, are very important for our kids to do. Um, so our department chairs are available for questions. If you have a general question that you want to ask any of us right now, that's great. If um, you have something a little bit more specific, you want to save it for more of a one-on-one -on -one conversation, we'll be down here for a little bit too. So I'll start off by taking some general questions. Yes. <clears throat> yes, it is. So the AP, I didn't mention that one today only because it's a, law and government is a required class for all seniors. There is an option to take it at the AP level. Uh, AP Law and Gov is always offered second semester senior year. 
Um, it's something that if you are coming up from the APUS level, you would just move into that. Um, and we do have an application process that students who are in the 300 level can express interest in. It's pretty intensive, as you can imagine, because it's second semester and APs are always in early May. Um, so this year, knock on wood, I shouldn't say anything, we don't have any snow days yet, uh, which has been nice for that class, but on years where we have a lot of snow days, they just have to kind of roll with it and, and make it work. Um, so it's, it's pretty fast paced, um, but it is something that students typically, typically do enjoy and is a class that we've seen growth in over the last few years. Other general questions? Yes, in the back. So they're very different courses in that uh, AP Biology course is tied to a specific content area and really delves down deeply into the biological sciences uh, <clears throat> from the micro like looking at cells to more of a macro approach in terms of ecosystems and how ecosystems work. Whereas the AP Environmental Science is more of a survey of a variety of science content. So you, we expect students to be able to utilize background knowledge in biology and chemistry and earth sciences, some basic physics, um, and, and utilize those content areas to really see how humans interact with and impact um, both the local and, and global environments. So um, I. I it, they're very different courses in, in the depth at which the science is utilized, but the application of that science or a variety of science content in the AP environmental science is, um, as I said, not as in-depth, but um, certainly more, uh, more wide-ranging in terms of what students are expected to um, utilize as, in terms of the sciences. Over here on the left. Is that a, this, uh, any, anything, any? So the, the honors level courses traditionally have more of a locally designed curriculum and they are more rigorous in nature than say the 300 level courses. Um, college board is, um, sort of dictates the content and the skills that are utilized within an AP level class. <clears throat> so there's less, um, less creativity, I guess, and, and less local decisions on what is being taught um, because those classes ultimately culminate in an AP exam at the end. So there's specific content and skills in, in all of our areas that need to be focused on within an AP class, whereas um, in physics, a physics honors class, the teachers can have, uh, have a much more of a say in terms of the content and the skills that are being delivered uh, throughout the course of the year. Both are rigorous in nature, both are um, higher, you know, for students to utilize a variety of higher order thinking skills. Um, I think the main difference really is uh, the fact that there's more, um, it's more targeted and, and dictated in terms of the curriculum for the AP courses and, and those also can end up giving students an opportunity for college credit or meeting some college um, requirements after taking that, that AP exam. Yeah, and in reviewing the course catalog, you'll see in certain content areas, there are some instances where, um, let's say for science, um, where you can either do, uh, uh, there's uh, an honors chemistry choice and there's an AP uh, chemistry and you're supposed to do the honors before you go, or a standard 300 level before you go to the AP. Whereas in some of our other areas, um, there isn't that choice of an honors and an AP. So like in math, there's the standard level calculus or there's the AP calculus. There's no honors calculus in between. So it just varies from uh, department to the department. Yes. So, so the question is how many courses um, are students required to take? So um, we have an eight, uh, we schedule for eight periods with our current schedule, right? And out of that eight, students are supposed to take um, six courses plus their health and their PE, okay? Now for many students, they take 
um, a, a science class that carries uh, a lab, and that lab often goes into an additional period. Um, and so that takes up kind of like seven periods um, in their day. So oftentimes our students will have one free period or in, in freshman year that is their study hall. Um, but typically a student will carry six courses plus um, their PE and their science course. Um, come senior year, students have the option to only carry five as long as they're registered for and enrolled in at least three upper level courses. So that's either an honors or an AP course. Um, but that's just reserved for, for senior year. Um, and in instances too, um, for students with um, IEPs, you know, they typically will have a learning center and that learning center counts as one of the six courses uh, that they're registered for because it's credit bearing also. Follow up. Um, I mean, I think it varies from student to student. Unfortunately, there's no one inclusive um, answer for, for everyone. Um, I, I will say the, our, our biggest concern with students taking eight classes is their overall balance and their, their school life balance. And for um, some kids, that might be very appropriate for them to do that. I would say um, that would be the rarity, that most of our students really do need that break in their schedule. And having that eighth course is uh, the potential to be very overwhelming. So um, I think colleges would say they just want to make sure that kids' well-being and their mental state are, are healthy. And that's the most important piece, regardless of their GPA or how many courses they're, they're taking. But again, I will say there are some instances where students will do that. Um, they might double up in, let's say, uh, music and art. And like that art class is their eighth course or their music class is their eighth course or something like that. So definitely a possibility, but I, I will say from, from my, for those of you who don't know, prior to being assistant principal, I was the director of guidance for, for nine years and, and worked in that area. And um, it's rare to see a student that does that rigor successfully. Let me put it that way. Sure. Keith. Can I, can I yeah. answer that? Is that okay? Um, I don't know if this is helpful, but one, one of the questions that I often will ask students when they uh, are asking about what classes they should take and what they should consider is they kind of walk them through their current schedule, their current life right now. So how much work do you get? How hard are the classes that you're taking? How much spare time do you have? Um, and that encompasses their school, their work outside of school, family obligations, athletic or extracurriculars. You know, do you have enough time to get a good night's sleep and still be social with your family and friends? Um, and then I ask them to think about, you know, next year when you're wanting to take on X, Y, and Z classes, how much harder is it going to be? Next year when you're in a varsity instead of a JV team, how much harder is it going to be? And just try to get them to think about their overall schedule um, because I think it, there may be some days that it's super easy for them, but there may be some days or periods of, or windows of time that it's really challenging. So I always try to get them to really think about the entire, entire picture, their sleep, their social life, their uh, extracurricular life, and their academic life, if that's helpful. Other general questions? So again, as a reminder, we're going to stay up here. So if you want to come down afterwards, uh, we're more than happy to answer anything. Or if you want to send anyone an email afterwards as a follow-up, that's uh, very much uh, uh, an option, too. So thank you very much, everyone. really appreciate you coming in. Have a healthy and wonderful rest of your day.